John F. Kennedy once said, a man may die, nations may rise and fall, but an idea lives on. So what happens when somebody comes up with a bad idea? What happens if somebody comes up with dangerous ideas? What happens if you're born and raised only knowing those ideas? Do you even stand a chance? People kill for all sorts of reasons, but generally the most socially acceptable reason is patriotism. You're killing for a cause. You're being a hero, right? At least that's how you see yourself. Your enemies have a completely different perspective. And then what happens if your side, your opinions, the thing that you represent is so minute in the grand scheme of things that it really is you and a handful of others against the world. Would that make you defend your people less or more intensely? These mentalities are often common within cults, especially religious cults, where there's some sort of messiah or a prophet that the members of the cult can rally around. Oftentimes, these charismatic leaders imbue their flock with the idea that if they're arrested, if they're attacked, if they're held accountable, this is all a sign that they truly are the one true prophet or the one true God among men. Facing adversity is a common trope. It's the way martyrs are made. So if you've been hearing for years and years and years, if the FBI comes and accuses me of doing this or doing that, it's just a sign of the end of days. It's just a sign that I really am who I say I am. And then the FBI comes knocking, you're gonna be inclined to think that it really is a sign. When the reality is often that leaders of cults have to prime their followers with that idea so that if they are held accountable for running a cult or exploiting the members, they can still spin that. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about one of the most brutal cults that I've personally ever heard of. This cult spilled the blood of their enemies in an attempt to get closer to God. This cult moved more like a mafia or a cartel than a traditional Mormon group. This cult leader was dubbed by the media as the Mormon Manson and held a consistent spot on the FBI's top 10 most wanted, often occupying number one. We're going to be talking about the Ervil LeBaron group. Hi guys, I know, I know, I didn't post for two weeks, I'm sorry. I promise it was it was worth it. I was doing important stuff. I'm starting a podcast, you guys have all asked for a podcast, and I was interviewing my first celebrity guest, which was Neil deGrasse Tyson. So I had to leave my house where I had all my filming stuff so that I could go to a studio in New York and I could interview him there. So I promise I have like a good excuse, but to make it up to you guys, I am doing like a two-parter, okay? So I'm gonna post two videos this week. They're gonna be complete independently. I guess the best way that I can describe this is the first case informs the second, all right? It's a multi-generational case. So part one, we're gonna be focusing on one generation. Part two, we're gonna be focusing on the next. Before I get into the story, I just wanna give a shout out to Daughters of the Cult. It's a docu-series that's on Hulu right now and it's really, really good. It's where I got the vast majority of the information that's gonna be presented in this deep dive. I would highly encourage you guys to watch it, not only because it's really good, but because there is going to be a strong distinction between my video and what you get from the docu-series. The docu-series follows the children of the cult. They talk directly about their experiences, what it was like to grow up in this, how they feel about faith now, how they feel about their father, how they feel about their brothers and sisters who may or may not have committed crimes, may or may not be dead now, may or may not have gotten arrested. And in my video, I'm not going to be quoting any of the children. I'm not gonna be giving their perspectives. I'm purely going to go over the timeline of this cult, the things that they were doing, what the leaders were up to, how the police were involved, and really just approach it from a case standpoint. The reason why I want to do that is because the former members of this cult are speaking to their own experiences. 
and I think it's important that their actual voices be heard. So if you want to get a direct perspective from somebody who was raised in that environment, I don't want to put words in their mouth, I don't want to paraphrase, and I don't even want to quote them because the reality is they sat down and they took their time to talk about these incredibly traumatic things that happened to them. And I just feel that by trying to recreate what they said in their confessionals and in their interview process, it would just end up watering things down. By watching my video, you're gonna get a full understanding of like what this cult did, how it functioned, what crimes were committed, who lived, who died, what psychological tactics were utilized, what makes this cult different, what the trials were like, who was involved, what do they worship? But again, if you want direct word of mouth from people who are actually in the cult, go watch Daughters of the Cult. They're doing a really brave thing. So I would just, I would behoove you all to go give them a chance to speak on their experiences. First, I just wanna give a brief overview of what the cult is famous for. The cult actually predated its infamy by an entire generation and then some. Originally, this cult, or I guess the FBI might refer to it more at that stage as a highly controlled group, was by all accounts a pretty peaceful polygamist group. The members were fundamentalists, they followed traditional Mormonism. Mainstream Mormonism doesn't involve polygamy today. And because of this, the cult actually moved down to Mexico when it was first formed because polygamy is not illegal there. It doesn't seem, at least from what information I found, that people had any real legitimate complaints about the group before Ervil LeBaron rose to power. Once Ervil rose to power, which we'll get into him, his background, how that all happened, but this is just still part of the overview. Once Ervil rose to power, the group went from just being like a random group of fundamentalist Mormons who practiced polygamy to now being this incredibly violent, dangerous polygamous cult, which is certainly a, a significant shift. Most notably, Ervil implemented the concept of blood atonement. Now this concept is not entirely his own. In the original writings by Joseph Smith, blood atonements are mentioned. It's a, a little more complex than I'm gonna make it, but just to summarize, it's essentially this concept that if somebody commits the ultimate sin, which is murder, that then they must also be killed and their blood must hit the ground and be soaked into the earth if there is any hope for salvation. So it is, quite literally the ultimate form of atonement for the ultimate sin. Mainstream Mormonism naturally does not adhere to this practice. In fact, most fundamentalist groups don't care about the blood atonement as a concept either. Ervil took this idea and he really warped it. He turned blood atonements within his cult into this idea of killing your rivals, killing anybody who you think is trying to leave the cult. So not only was he killing people who were in the cult, but he was killing people who were in other cults that he considered to be his enemies, that of course he naturally deemed to be false prophets. Of course, the idea of a blood sacrifice is controversial, but even amongst fundamentalist groups, it's very controversial as well, because as far as their beliefs go, Jesus cannot redeem an eternal sin. So this blood sacrifice is just an attempt at atonement. There's not even any sort of like guarantee. But before we get too off track, let's rewind a little bit. I wanna talk about this group while it was still run by Joel. Herbal's brother. This is when the church was still referred to as Church of the Firstborn of the Fullness of Times. Kind of a mouthful. Because this was a polygamous group, there were three tiers of glory. And the tiers of glory are essentially, like in layman's terms, levels of heaven. So there is the telestial level, which is the first and lowest level. There is the terrestrial level, which is the second medium level. And then of course there's the celestial level, which is the highest level. And the celestial level, of course, is the level that everybody who follows these, these teachings wants to reach. And it is impossible to reach the celestial level without engaging in plural marriage or polygamy. This is a very traditional Mormon belief. And again, most Mormons don't adhere to this belief anymore, but more fundamentalist groups still hold on to it. But this wasn't just like a super fundamentalist old school group. It still had its own little twist to it because rather than following all of the basic Mormon practices, 
the group was supposed to follow Ervil and Joel. And they claimed that this was necessary because Jesus was coming soon. And they specifically were the ones who were uniting the house of God. In Mormon ideology, there's this person who's called the one mighty and strong. And this is essentially like the man who is going to save the world. And according to this group, Joel was the one mighty and strong. And Joel didn't just randomly decide that that's who he was. He was given that title by his father who had formally run the group before him and Ervil was in support of this, at least initially. In fact, Ervil worked really, really hard to build up Joel's church, harder than basically anybody else. And while Joel, at least within this group, was quite literally more beloved than Jesus Christ himself, Ervil was actually the one who was bringing in most of the recruits, aka he was bringing in most of the money to the cult. And Ervil loved money. He actually used a lot of this money to buy himself a golden car, which he dubbed the golden calf. And to put that choice into perspective, I just want to lay out just how many people are living in this same place, relying on this same concentrated income. Ervil himself would go on to father more than 50 kids. That's just the ones that they can count. There's a lot of kids who have like question marks over them. They may or may not be Ervils as well. And he would go on to have 14 wives. Everyone's living in this single homestead in Mexico and the homestead has no running water. On top of this, they have such limited income that no one in the homestead can even afford shoes. So with so many people in one place, obviously they have to pinch pennies. So when it came to hygiene, everyone would take one bath once a week. And in sort of like Victorian style, they would fill up a bathtub and they would start with the oldest, have them take a bath and reuse the water all the way down to the youngest. That's actually where the phrase like, th don't throw the baby out with the bath water comes from because Victorian families would do the same process. And of course, oldest, youngest, the baby's the last one to be washed in like the disgusting water. But this is so many people, one bath, I have to imagine that water, no one's wearing any shoes, had to be truly putrid after like five people. Also, Ervil and Joel aren't even like the only brothers. They are one of four kids, so they also have another brother. Verlin, he's the youngest brother, so that's why he's not like in the same power position as Ervil and Joel. But Verlin will go on to have 58 kids himself. So you have to imagine, this is a lot of people sharing all the same resources, and yet Ervil decided to buy himself a gold car. Of course, like he's bringing in a little bit more money at this time, but surely there were higher priorities than that. And something that's important to note about Ervil is that he was actually very, very handsome. He was very charismatic and he knew the religious texts better than anybody else at the homestead. On top of that, everyone was pretty much unanimous in the fact that he was really, really good at reading people. So when he would go out recruiting people, he would push through those layers of skepticism, slowly break down those walls, and he would only start the actual recruiting process when he saw the flip switch in whoever he was talking to his head that let him know this person is now at a point with me in this conversation where they're susceptible. And only then would he make his move. Because he's the one bringing in all these recruits, bringing in all this money, you might think that like people aren't gonna complain about the car, but that's not true. People were upset about the car. There was a lot of tension in general about the way that Ervil was, was spending money. And of course, under these conditions, there's a lot of slave labor going on at the homestead. There's a lot of like free labor that just has to happen in order for things to run relatively smoothly. So although Ervil was the hardest worker in terms of recruiting, he was the laziest worker in terms of doing any actual hard labor at the homestead to the point where he actually didn't really do any. So not only did he go out and buy this golden car that he called the golden calf, but he's not really pulling his weight at home. People are noticing this, people are complaining to Joel and Joel, he's not really a confrontational guy. He was very peace and love, stay close to God. He would have revelations. We're supposed to do this now, God told me that. Joel is essentially exactly what you would picture if somebody prompted you to picture like a non-violent polygamous cult leader. Although he's doing things differently, although like 
people seem to be getting exploited. There's not like overt acts of violence or aggression coming from Joel. It seems like Joel really believes in what he's doing, or at the very least he's selling it, I guess. Which is why it was super awkward when Herbal suddenly started having revelations. Doesn't quite make sense in terms of the literature. I mean, Joel's the prophet. Joel's the one who's supposed to be having the revelations. Why is, why is Ervil having revelations if he's not the prophet? There's only one prophet. And again, Joel was really passive. So at first he let a lot of this slide when realistically he, he probably shouldn't have. I mean, the revelations Ervil was having were, weren't small by any means. I mean, they were things as big as when the world was specifically going to end, who should marry who in the cult, even when some of the people who he was having revelations about were already married to other people. And interestingly, a lot of the marriage-based revelations went a lot like, whoa, I've just had a revelation. According to God, your wife is supposed to marry me. He literally started taking all of the other men in the cult's wives for his own. He wanted basically all of the wives to himself. And of course, the idea of Ervil having revelations at all goes against Joel's teachings, but the revelations themselves were in direct conflict with the things that Joel had had revelations about. And it gets to a point where everybody is essentially approaching Joel like, hey, you have to do something about this. He's a Judas in our midst, basically. And Joel finally agrees that he obviously can't control Herbal, so the most reasonable thing he can do is just to excommunicate him. And he does. And of course, Herbal's not one to go quietly into his good nights, so he just makes his own cult. I mean, I think it's, it's obvious that's where things were going anyway. So it now becomes a scenario where there's Joelites and the Herbalites. And Herbal dubs his new cult the Church of the Lamb of God, and he takes some people with him, about 150 members. Meanwhile, Joel's cult has about a thousand members. Herbal is competitive, and Herbal also knows that each member translates directly into money for the cult, because he was the main recruiter before. He knows the value of that. So it's not just an ego thing of how big is your flock, but it's definitely monetarily driven as well. So not only did Herbal want all of Joel's members, but more importantly, he wanted their money. It's at this point that the blood atonements get introduced. It seems to me that Herbal came to the conclusion that he wasn't really going to be able to successfully poach the members of Joel's cult so long as Joel was around. So he started teaching the blood atonement, which is something everyone was already familiar with, but again, it's controversial. Nobody was actually taking the blood atonement seriously or practicing it in any legitimate way up until this point. But Ervil doesn't care. He starts threatening the men in his cult, in the Church of the Lamb of God. He brings guns in because previously in Joel's cult, there weren't guns. And when Ervil and Joel's father ran the cult, there weren't guns. And once guns are brought in, Ervil starts running military drills. He starts training what can really only be described as a militia. He's not focusing specifically on the adults, no. He's training the children with machine guns, children as young as six. And he decides if this militia is gonna have any sort of legitimacy, there needs to be a general. There needs to be somebody whose specific job is just running these drills, teaching people how to use guns, indoctrinating the kids to this degree of violence. So he appoints a member known as Dan Jordan to be this general. And Dan was brutal. He already had a reputation for being very tough, very intense, and he certainly knew his way around a gun. <laughs> but Dan also wasn't the type to do things for free, and Ervil knew that, so Ervil started treating his own daughters, and just the daughters of the cult in general, as currency. So he offered to pay Dan Jordan for this new position as general with two of his daughters as a salary. This was supposed to be in exchange for Dan's loyalty to Herbal in particular, because naturally you don't want the person who's training your military to come to the conclusion that they could just be the leader of the cult. They're the one in charge of all of the guns. So 
Herbal had at least a base understanding of this and he realized that he had to do something to make it worth Dan's while. And of course, this wouldn't be a cult if the children weren't being trained specifically to fight in God's War because there always has to be some sort of rhetoric surrounding why you're doing whatever you're doing within the cult. So Ervil is very quickly creating a very dangerous situation within his cult. And meanwhile, Joel is still doing the same stuff Joel has always done. His followers are getting increasingly concerned about the Church of the Lamb of God, especially with Dan Jordan now acting as a general, but Joel tells all of them not to worry and that Ervil is all talk. Also, that's his brother. Even though they might not always get along, he didn't have any legitimate concerns that Ervil would ever do anything to him. In juxtaposition to this, Ervil was at the very same time telling his followers that anybody who wasn't following him, didn't believe him, was being wicked and must die. Painting Joel as a false prophet. Unsurprisingly, Dan shows up one day to meet with Joel. And when he shows up, he's got a gun and he has two other followers from the Church of the Lamb of God with him. He tells Joel that he just wants to talk and Joel being the gentle and passive guy that he was took this at face value and he allowed Dan Jordan to lure him away from the central area of the homestead out to a shack further towards the edge of the property. And once they're inside this shack, Dan Jordan then breaks a chair, takes a chair leg and starts beating Joel senseless. And once he's beaten him essentially to a pulp, he takes the gun and he shoots him in the mouth thereby assassinating him on his own property. This can't be described as anything other than a Judas moment since Dan Jordan was previously a follower of Joel as well. It's clear to everybody who is in Joel's flock that Ervil is behind this. I mean, Dan Jordan is his right-hand man. He's not acting independently. This was clearly an order given by Ervil. Ervil suspected that this might happen. So he goes on the run, but his followers don't really realize that that's what he's doing. Because the way that he covers it up is he keeps telling them that he's having revelations. Oh, I have to go here, I have to go there, I have to go out. I need to have an experience, I need to be alone. And this is just his way of covering up the fact that he's a fugitive. And it's not clear if his followers are aware of what has happened to Joel at this point in time. But I wouldn't be surprised if some of the older kids and the adults started to find out because while the FBI was looking for Ervil, he started to get concerned that maybe he should move some of the members of his cult. Maybe he should move some of the kids. Maybe he should move some of his wives, but they couldn't just overtly cross the border from Mexico. So what he did is he loaded up one night in the middle of the night with no prior warning, dozens of his children into a moving truck. He takes three of his wives and 20 of his children and loads them up in this truck crosses the border with them successfully and transplants them in Colorado. And the home that these 23 people have been smuggled into is only 1,500 square feet. The landlords and the neighbors have no idea that there's 23 people living in here. They would never allow it. I mean, it's just not safe from a fire code perspective either. So no one was allowed outside. They were trying to give off the impression that two people, a couple, lived in this house. So all of the children had to hide during the day, had to stay away from any windows, and then at nighttime, all 20 of them would sleep on the floor in the living room. It's at this time that the children begin their training in how to speak to law enforcement. They're, they're embedded with this deep mistrust of any FBI agents, any police, any social workers, and so they're trained to say the same thing to every single question. Hey there, what's your name? I don't know. Where do you live? I don't know. Who's your dad? I don't know. Is your mom here? I don't know. Where are you from? I don't know. How old are you? I don't know. This went on for months and months and months. And eventually one day, Ervil in his hubris just decided that he was fed up with it. So he walked directly into a Mexican jail, told them who he was, what he was being accused of, why he was being searched, why he was a fugitive, why he was on the run, and he was put in jail. He waited for trial for a year, and during this time, 
Herbal was still allowed to have conjugal visits of sorts. When most people think of conjugal visits, they think of a jail having some sort of specific trailer that has like a bed in it or something, but that wasn't the case here. The case here was that any number of his wives could visit, one at a time of course, and they would just be in his cell where he had a cellmate. So they would throw a blanket over the bottom bunk and that's where the conjugal visit would happen. And he actually fathered multiple children during this year long stint in jail while he was awaiting trial. After a year, he goes to trial and he's sentenced for being the intellectual author of his brother Joel's murder. And he's given 12 years in prison. But the very next day, the charges are dropped. It's deemed to be a mistrial by a higher court due to a technicality. So Ervil walks free. And this moment is very important because to his flock, this solidified that he likely really is the true prophet. Because when he had turned himself in, his wives, his children, they were like, why? Why have you done this? And he told them that he knew that God would protect him. And now this mistrial's happened. So maybe God really did protect him. At least that's what they're thinking. What I think is that he likely paid off somebody because bribing federales and court systems in Mexico was pretty commonplace at this time. And he obviously had a large pool of money due to the sheer number of people in the cult. But what do I know? What I do know is that once he beat these charges, he got more wives than ever, more money than ever, and more guns than ever. Meanwhile, Joel's church is left reeling. I mean, this was a guy who by all accounts seemed to be pretty nice as far as cult leaders go. I don't wanna to speak too positively of Joel just because I have limited information on him and cults typically involve a lot of exploitation and it's not uncommon for that exploitation to be of minors as well. So I don't wanna hype Joel up or anything like that, but it is still sad whenever there's a loss of life, let alone when it's by the hands of your brother. I mean, that's truly a, a, a horrific way to die and it seems that a lot of people did end up missing Joel. His younger brother Verlin, the third brother, being one of them. Verlin was actually the one who was set to inherit the church. And Verlin is not as passive as Joel was. He knows right away that he's got a target on his back. That Ervil's not going to be fully satisfied until he gets the 1,000 members of this previous church to convert to his cult. And because of this, Verlin is incredibly paranoid. He knows that something is eventually going to happen. He's just not sure when. And of course, something did happen. And actually, no one, not even Verlin, saw it coming. Because the thing is, it was the day after Christmas. Joel's original homestead that Verlin had now inherited sort of functioned like a small town. It was in a very isolated part of Mexico, and so they had their own sort of city center. And in the middle of this homestead's town was this large water tower. In the middle of the night, when everyone is relaxed and calm and still high off of the holiday spirit, that water tower would suddenly burst into flames. It would explode. Because of the loud noise and the fact that they're in this remote area, everybody runs out of the homestead to see what's happened. And when they see that this really important resource is on fire, they start grabbing buckets so that they can try and put it out running towards the tower. And unfortunately, this was exactly what Ervil expected them to do. See, he had had his militia positioned around the exterior of the homestead so that once this explosion went off and everybody rushed out to see what had happened, they would now be open season. The militia started shooting into the crowd and they didn't stop there. They started throwing Molotov cocktails on top of all of the buildings, setting the entire homestead ablaze. There was nowhere to retreat from the gunfire because everything was quickly engulfed in flames. 24 homes were burnt down that night. 19 people ended up in critical condition. Two people died and countless others were injured. And to make things worse, this was family on family crime. Everybody in this new cult used to belong to the old cult. They all recognized everyone who was firing upon them. It was people that they knew and loved. And shockingly, Verlin actually made it out unscathed purely due to the fact that he wasn't present. 
when the attack took place. He was so paranoid that Erbil would try and assassinate him that he had been avoiding the homestead. And this intuition is likely the thing that saved his life. But he wasn't the only key player who was notably missing because Erbil wasn't present either. In fact, Erbil always knew to stay away from a crime that he had ordered so that he could feign ignorance. It wasn't me, I'm, I have nothing to do with this, I wasn't even there. He would brainwash young members of his cult to commit violent crimes on his behalf so that he could keep his hands clean while still exacting his will. This brings up two key players in all of this, Rena and Ramona. Rena was Erbil's 13th wife, but that's not where their dynamic began. Actually, back when she was just 12 years old is when Erbil first started to, air quote, pursue her. The proper term is G-R-O-O-M, her. But YouTube really doesn't like that word. It's at that time that he started touching her inappropriately and saying that it would be God's will that she would marry him one day. Rena was never positively swayed by Erbil during any of this. And I say that because a lot of the times when you're young and someone older is giving you inappropriate attention, you may not realize the repercussions that that's going to have. And a lot of people have guilt as adults about the ways that they may have acted when they were younger, but the reality is you weren't putting yourself in that situation. An adult was creating that situation for you and putting you in it. Your reactions to that are completely irrelevant. They should have never created that situation in the first place. Erbil and many other cult leaders know that the only way that you can convince super young girls into marrying these sort of geriatric men is by forcing them to marry you as young as possible so that they don't have the maturity level to try and escape that situation or assert any semblance of control or individuality. And by the time that Rena was 16, 17 years old, she was steadfast in the fact that she did not want to marry Erbil even though she did believe that he was the prophet. She just didn't want to marry him. And magically around that time, Erbil had a revelation that now was the time that she had to marry him so that she was unable to escape his clutches, unfortunately. The second person I brought up was Ramona. Ramona was Rena and Erbil's daughter, and she had actually had a very similarly tragic experience. It was with Dan Jordan, who she was eventually married off to via revelation as well. It's at this point in the story that Rulin Allred becomes relevant. That name might sound familiar to some of you, and if it does, it's because Rulin Allred was a much more successful, I guess you could say, cult leader around the same time, also in the Mormon fundamentalist space. He had a flock of about 12,000 people, which absolutely dwarfs the 150 people that Erbil had under his control. Now, there's a lot of controversy surrounding Rulin Allred. It's completely separate of this case. But Rulin Allred was the leader of the AUB, and he was also notably a homeopathic healer. He's one of the more famous extremist leaders in the Mormon fundamentalist space. He was also a polygamist, having seven wives and 48 children between them. Due to the size of his flock, he obviously gained massive amounts of money, massive amounts of power, massive amounts of control and influence. And I think it's fair to say that he was actually somewhat mainstream. And unsurprisingly, Erbil absolutely coveted everything that Rulin had. Despite the amount of money that he had surely amassed by the size of his flock, he independently as a as a person actually lived somewhat modestly. But of course, if Erbil was in that same position, you can only imagine what he would do with those resources, those funds. So it's at this point that Erbil begins to introduce the idea to Rena and Ramona that Rulin Allred, somebody who essentially has nothing to do with Erbil, is a false prophet, that he's wicked, that he's bringing evil into the world, that something needs to be done about Rulin. And this was most certainly motivated by jealousy. He commands that his wife, Rena, and his stepdaughter, Ramona, carry out this execution of Rulin Allred. He tells them that he has had a revelation that it has to be them. And even if Rena and Ramona didn't believe that this was a revelation, even if they didn't want to do it, 
they kind of had no choice because the thing with Ervil and blood atonements was if you didn't follow through on a blood atonement, if you didn't execute somebody who Ervil said that you were meant to execute, you would now be somebody who's also on the chopping block because you're not listening to the prophet. You're going against the prophet even. So it automatically puts a huge target on your back and you may very well be the next victim of one of these blood atonements because of that. So on May 10th, 1977, Rena and Ramona set forth on their mission. Rulin had a medical facility for his homeopathic work. So Rena and Ramona knew that that's somewhere that they could easily find him that was open to the public. Anybody could walk in. So Rena and Ramona walk in to Rulin's medical office and they empty the chamber. Rena was actually the only active shooter Ramona had frozen in the moment due to fear. And so immediately after emptying the gun, the women flee the scene. Rena and Ramona get back in their car. Rena knows that she has shot Rulin at least four times successfully, but she starts to panic. She thinks to herself, the instructions were that I had to make sure that he was dead. And by the time that I was running out, it seemed like he was still alive. So she decides that she has to run back in there and finish the job. So she ran back inside and she shot Rulin Allred in the face to make sure that he was truly dead. And after Rena had returned to the car, allegedly she was very calm because the thing is she didn't think that she'd done anything wrong. I mean, she was just carrying out God's will. So after the news breaks that Rulin Allred an incredibly influential person in Salt Lake City at this time, has been murdered in his office at age 71. It's not long before people start suspecting Ervil LeBaron had something to do with this. It was somewhat common knowledge how jealous Ervil was of Rulin, how much he coveted what he had. So as the police begin their investigation, this is something they have in mind pretty much from the beginning. Shockingly, just a day later, two dumpster divers find a bag complete with evidence, something out of a movie. And in this single bag that carries all of the evidence from the murder, there is a gun with a serial number that directly implicates Ervil because the serial number on the gun can be traced directly to Rena's sister-in-law. And Rena is obviously Ervil's 13th wife. So this is the first evidential connection between Rulin and his death and Ervil. This coupled with the literal massacre at the original homestead and Joel's mistrial. Like all signs are pointing to Herbal. This seems like a pattern of behavior. It's obvious that he has at the very least in the past been the author of several other violent crimes and murders. He now has an established history where he's at the very least suspected, if not literally found to be guilty of being the author of other murders. So the FBI puts him on the very top of the top 10 most wanted list. Because at this point in time, he's essentially acting like a domestic terrorist. To give you a good idea of like the climate of America at this time, like this is just 10 years after the Manson murders. So the public is having a real feeling of like, oh my God, it's happening again. There's a real panic that like, this is going to continue to spiral. It's gonna be a bigger and bigger issue. And because of the sheer mass of influence that Rulin had, not only are all of his followers, which is again, 12,000 people going to show up to his funeral, but he had a much broader net than that. He touched a lot of lives outside of those who were actually in his cult. So his funeral is about to be this massive thing in Salt Lake City. And because of that, everyone is worried that something bad is going to happen there. I mean, Ervil ordered the murder of his own brother. Ervil had a militia that he trained go and kill people in his family in mass just the day after Christmas. So who's to say that Ervil's not going to consider a funeral fair game? On top of that, Verlin is planning on showing up to the funeral. So that just adds more intrigue for Ervil. That's somebody else who's on his hit list. And just as authorities had suspected, Ervil is planning on attacking the funeral. In fact, he sends a van filled to the brim with people equipped with machine guns so that they can go in and kill not only Verlin, but basically anybody else that they want to. Because authorities had suspected something like this might happen, 
the van, which makes it all the way to the funeral. Despite the fact that they have a heavy amount of firearms in the car, they somehow go unnoticed, concerningly. But when they see the heavy police presence, when they see that there's literal snipers in the trees surrounding the funeral area, they decide that this is a suicide mission and they bail. And so their plan to kill Verlin, it's a failure. And mind you, they know that like they might potentially die as a result for failing to follow through, but the police presence was so heavy that they knew for a fact they would die if they went into that funeral. Whereas Ervil only might kill them for failing to complete the task. This is when Rebecca enters the picture. And Rebecca's role is a very key one in all of this. This time the FBI is continuing to delve into Ervil's past and he's continuing to successfully evade them. And it's during this process that they come across the disappearance of Rebecca, who's Ervil's 17 year old daughter who had disappeared years before all of this. Rebecca was Ervil's daughter from his first marriage, the first wife out of the 13. And Rebecca was actually pregnant with her second child during the time of her disappearance. And some important context to add is that Rebecca had pretty severe mental health issues, which is unsurprising. I mean, how many people can go through the kind of socialization that these kids are going through and come out the other side fine and dandy? Very few, if any. I would be skeptical, if any. And even if you do come out with a secure attachment style and you're very mentally healthy and resilient and not struggling with any sort of mental health repercussions would be despite your circumstances. One of the things that Rebecca was most outspoken about was the fact that she didn't like being a plural wife. And she pointed to the plural lifestyle as being one of the things exacerbating her underlying mental health issues, one of the major contributors to her panic attacks and depression and anxiety. Becca's mental health had gotten to a point of instability where a lot of people felt that she might actually be a liability. She was running through the homestead town naked, screaming, crying, yelling about how she didn't like polygamy. To me, that sounds like an episode of some sort. I don't want to play armchair psychologist and say like, oh, it's probably the result of SA or it's the result of schizophrenia or it's the result of this or that or whatever. It's clear that she's acting in ways that other members of the cult tend not to. And of course, Ervil especially didn't like this. And as a result, allegedly several cult members would take Rebecca up a mountain strangle her and then bury her in a shallow grave. And I say allegedly because to this day, Rebecca's body has yet to be recovered. And even at the time of her disappearance, no one really looked into it. I mean, like, no one outside of the cult really cared. And even within the cult, very few people were worried about Rebecca. They just thought she'd run off She'd been acting strangely. She probably just ran off. It didn't seem like she liked the lifestyle anyway. And it wasn't the most uncommon thing for people to run away. Her siblings, on the other hand, knew something bad had happened to her. They knew Rebecca. They knew what she would and wouldn't do. Even if she was experiencing a mental health crisis, they felt that there were certain parameters, certain lines that she likely wouldn't cross. And so to them, the fact that Rebecca just disappeared, left her children behind, it didn't sit well with them. So they knew something bad had happened to her, but they never suspected that their father was at the root of it all. Not only did Ervil kill his own brother, as well as other people who he considered to be family, because they were all in the same community, but Ervil has now officially killed one of his children as well, which is just absolutely terrible. And not that there's a good reason to kill your child, of course there's not really a good reason to kill anyone, but it was just because he was worried that she would bring heat on the cult, that it would make him look bad, that it would make people look into the things that he was doing, that she was just a liability because she was more difficult to control. Because Ervil was well aware of the kind of trouble that you can get in just for running a cult, let alone for participating in this high level of violence that he was, he had secret rooms set up at the homestead in case there were FBI raids. These secret rooms were for any fugitive members or for unmarked weapons. 
And on top of all the illegal things that Ervil was obviously participating in, you, you also have to throw slavery into the mix and child labor because Ervil was exploiting children in a variety of means. He was using them for commercial labor, which there's no other word for that beyond slavery because these children were not being compensated. If the children were being paid, that would still be child labor, but they were expected to do it for free. So it's child slave labor. So when Ervil became number one on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list, his first wife, Delfina got an idea because she had always been suspicious of Rebecca's disappearance. She knew that something terrible had happened to her and she felt that it was foul play. And her son, Isaac, who was just 15 at the time, felt the same way. So when Ervil started making direct threats to Isaac, insinuating that he might just kill him, Isaac and Delfina decided they should come forward out of fear that Ervil may have killed Rebecca and therefore might also kill Isaac, which it does sound like he was sort of gearing up to do. So Isaac then goes on to name Rulon's killers, Rena and Ramona, as well as two key members of the massacre. And because Isaac had been present in a great deal of the blood atonement meetings, he was able to give accurate and detailed testimony against his own father. With all of this, the FBI really starts upping their search efforts. In fall of 1977, at five in the morning, they execute another raid. This time, they raid the Colorado home in search for Ervil. 40 people were arrested, including Ramona, who was never actually charged, and the two people who Isaac had named as key members of the massacre. But the FBI was sad to report that there was no sign of Rita and there was no sign of Ervil, and those were the two who they wanted most desperately. So shortly thereafter, the FBI executes a second raid at a different location, and this time they find Rita as well as Dan Jordan. And it just so happens that at the same time down in Mexico, the Federales were also executing a raid. And at this time, they actually find Ervil, but he looks like so they don't think that it's him. He looks so disheveled that they're like, there's no way that this is the allegedly handsome, charismatic prophet of this cult that's like on the FBI's number one top 10 most wanted list. There's literally no way. And weirdly, maybe out of hubris, I really don't know, Herbal, when he's taken into custody by them, admits that he is Herbal. They just don't believe him. So they actually have him in custody and he's saying it's him. And they're still like, nah. Meanwhile, Dan's in custody and he's saying that he's Dan, but they suspect that he's actually Herbal. So when they tell him, we don't think you're Dan Jordan, we think you're Herbal LeBaron, he embraces it. He's like, oh yeah, I totally am. So that he can cover, take the fall for the actual Herbal. Meanwhile, actual Herbal's just been let go because they think he's some lunatic of no importance. And while Rita's in custody, she literally mocks the Federales, telling them that they're so stupid because they just had Herbal and decided to randomly let him go. And it's at that point that they realize they might have just made a mistake. And by the time they come to this conclusion, he's naturally long gone. Everyone from the cult is starting to move again. They're starting to scatter with all of these raids. They're going into hiding. And these two notable higher ups in the cult Mark and his wife Lillian, they try to cross the border. And when they're trying to cross the border, they're apprehended and Mark claims that he is the one who killed Rulon. He did this because he wanted to be able to testify on Rena's behalf and he believed that God would have his back and he would just get out of it because he was actually obviously completely innocent in all of this. And a quick thing on him, he actually was notably a really good dad. Um, all of his kids only have positive things to say about him. His wife really loved him. He only had one wife, contrary to what everybody else in the cult was doing. And when he was arrested, he actually was smiling and waving to his kids just so that they wouldn't be scared because they didn't really understand what was going on. So they're seeing him get handcuffed and he's like, bye guys, I'll see you later. It's fine, it's fine. Meanwhile, he's about to be thrown in custody by border patrol and then handed over to the FBI. At this point, the prosecutors feel that they have enough to move forward, at least in terms of the trial surrounding Rulon's death. Ervil is still on the run, and as trial is starting to get underway, these prosecutors, security, jury members, they're all receiving threats. 
and there's real concern that the witnesses in this case may end up being attacked in the courtroom and killed before they're able to give their testimonies. Because up until this point, Ervil's executions that he had ordered were so bold, so brash, that people felt like, why wouldn't the trial be on the table to Ervil? It's yet another public gathering where he knows somebody's gonna be in a specific place at a specific time. So all of this was cause for major concern. Four people were on trial, but Rena was of course the main focus. And at this time, Rena was actually pregnant and the jury was mainly made up of women. So her team implored her to try and appeal to those women, especially because the jury were themselves victims of direct intimidation, which Rita's team argued that so was she. She's no different. She was under the intimidation and brainwashing of Ervil LeBaron. And so in the same way that the jury is worried that they're being followed, worried that they may be attacked, that's exactly how Rena was feeling. There's a sort of symmetry there. I think because of that, after just a four hour deliberation, Rena was found not guilty and all four were acquitted because the jury saw just over the course of the trial just how extreme the intimidation from Ervil could be just from a distance to strangers, to people he didn't know, people he'd never talked to. So one can only imagine how severe it must be for somebody who was married to him, who'd been around him for years, who believed that he was a literal prophet. Because again, the jury didn't believe that, they just thought he was a scary guy. A couple other logistical things that contributed to this is, there was no positive ID on Rena, surprisingly, despite the fact that this assassination happened in broad daylight. And like I said, Rena was operating under threat and the jury was themselves victims of intimidation, which may have influenced their decision, not just from an empathetic point of view, but from a fearful one. And at the same time, this is 1979, Dan Jordan is let free from a Mexican jail. It seems like up until this point, Ervil just keeps getting away with it. Everybody knows it's him, but nobody can nail him down. And both end up returning to the home in Colorado. And this is where Dan really starts to crack down on the slave labor. He's running this appliance store where they're taking electronics, they're flipping them, they're fixing them up, and they're reselling them. And of course, he's having all of the children do this on his behalf. And the budget for all of the kids in this coal tour in Colorado, half of them are still in Mexico, was about $20 a month for all of their collective food. That's how scarce the food is. That's, that's how limited the funds are. So Dan comes out, he tells them that he's gonna give them $50 to go out shopping and buy new shoes, which mind you, the Colt used to have no shoes at all. So this is a huge offer and this is almost two months worth of food for everyone. This is an insane amount of money to these kids. So for 90 days, they work 12 hour days, no breaks for six days a week. And this would be really intense labor hours for anyone, let alone children. And the end of the summer comes, they're all waiting to find out who did the best job? Who's gonna get the $50? And Dan tells them, yes, yeah, sorry, we just don't actually have the money for it, as it turns out. Only for then, the next day, all Dan's kids come into the cult and they have new clothes, not just shoes, new everything. So it's clear that all of the work that all of the other kids had collectively put in that summer grinding so that they could get new shoes did actually generate pretty significant funds compared to what the Colt was used to, and they didn't reap any of the rewards for it. Now, meanwhile, Ervil is hiding out in a super remote town in Mexico, hundreds of miles away from any sort of police presence. Now, the townsfolk, they're aware of his presence. They know who he is, in fact, and they're pretty worried because just Last year, just one year before this, Jamestown had happened. And the people of this town, they don't want to be swept up in some sort of mass unaliving. They're worried that something like that might happen here, especially because it's in such a remote area. And in Jamestown, people who didn't drink the Kool-Aid were shot down. So they're concerned, like, what if I'm not even a member of this cult? What if, what if I don't believe in any of Ervil's nonsense and I still end up being victimized by this. 
And so because of this, they tell. They, they give away Herbal's location to authorities and he's then raided. When he's taken into custody and he's interviewed, he immediately starts spouting that he's the prophet. He says a bunch of crazy things. He says he's actually the real president of the United States. And actually just a couple years before this, he had requested that like the president tithe to him, like pay tithes, which is like a huge percentage of your uh, annual income. But he paints himself in what I believe to be an intentional way of looking insane or delusional. A lot of people try and go for the insanity plea. They think for some reason a uh, government run mental health institution is gonna be better than prison. It's not, uh, it's actually not. A lot of people who end up winning out on the insanity pleas later try and recant it. They, they try and get switched over to prison because Nothing's fun about being institutionalized. It, it's not a situation where you just sit and you go to talk therapy and you get to stare out a window, walk around a garden. It's not really anything like that. You're being treated for very serious maladies, which often involve very heavy medication. And in previous times, around this time, there were some pretty torturous methods that a lot of these facilities might employ in an attempt to help with or at the very least manage your symptoms. And the reason why I think he was intentionally presenting himself this way, because obviously, I mean, Erbil is crazy, but I think he was trying to paint himself in a certain way because whenever they tried to touch on Rulin, he was still cognizant enough, despite the fact that he was rambling and raving and doing all this stuff, he was still cognizant enough not to implicate himself. To me, that indicates that there is a certain amount of intention behind the things that he's saying. So in 1980, Ervil's trial in Salt Lake begins. He's given a public defender. When the public defender comes to meet him, he's disheveled. He has tons and tons of yellow page notes. He's constantly asking for more notebooks because he's receiving revelations still. Now the PD's main defense is simply that Ervil wasn't present for any of these crimes. I mean, he had this hill that he sort of had to fight his way up, the public defender that is where he had to try and find a way to humanize Herbal to the jury and to everybody else at court without actually letting him take the stand because he was so unreliable and he knew he would come across so poorly that it wouldn't do him any favors. So if he wanted to, at the very least, plead down, get the best possible outcome for Herbal, there was no way he was gonna let him take that stand. Especially when the testimony against Herbal was coming from his son, Isaac. Isaac got up there, he's this young man, he was very calm, he was very collected, he was very matter of fact about everything that he had witnessed, everything that had happened. He came across at court as a very reliable witness because he was a reliable witness. I just wanna take a moment to say like, Isaac is really a, a hero in this case because even if you know that like your parents are sort of objectively bad people, even if your parents have hurt you, traumatized you, done unspeakable, unconscionable things, it is still hard to get up and face them, especially with all the indoctrination that Isaac had experienced, especially with everything that he was tied up in. I'm sure there was a mentality of, this is on you too, within the cult and within anybody who had gone to the blood atonement meetings. But despite all of this, Isaac still took the stand and he still said, his whole honest truth in front of all of those people and in front of his father, who was no doubt staring him down throughout. In that moment, Isaac managed to stand up for all of his siblings, which there are dozens and dozens and dozens of them, mind you. He did an incredible thing that day. And because of that, after a three hour deliberation, the jury found Ervil guilty of murder in the first degree and guilty of conspiracy to commit murder as well for being the author of these crimes. This meant that Ervil would be sentenced to life in prison. And once Ervil was sentenced to life in prison, his ideas got significantly more extreme. He was receiving more revelations than ever. He was constantly in need of paper. Every single time his attorneys would come visit him, he would ask, did you bring notebooks? And he would show them what he's been working on. It's pages and pages. The guards of his cell would say that he was up all night just writing constantly. 
and when his wives and followers would visit, he would sneak these writings out to them so that they could be passed along to everybody else in the cult. And he could maintain some semblance of control and word over all of them. If you thought his previous ideals were violent before, this is a completely new level. These writings were so violent, so extreme, that it actually alienated a great deal of members from his cult. People who had still managed to stick by him through the trial, which was difficult for a lot of his followers to reconcile with, were now seeing these writings and they were just thinking, he's lost it. He's honestly lost it. Basically, overall, it was just not only much more violent, but a lot of it just didn't make sense. And his followers got to a point with it where most of them couldn't ignore that anymore. For example, one of the main things that he demanded happen was a prison break. They knew they couldn't possibly break him out of prison. It would just be a suicide mission. And so essentially like almost all of the adults ended up gathering around and being like, he's not in his right mind. Like we can't take his word as law right now. There's, there's simply no way that he actually thinks we can do this. So it really ended up fracturing the flock and on top of that a lot of the adults had actually gone to court been in the trial and now they were afraid of the very real repercussions that they witnessed firsthand that they knew would be on the table and then suddenly in 1981 Erfel was found dead his death is kind of weird so officially it's ruled a heart attack I'm not trying to fuel any sort of conspiracy here by the way this is just based on everybody else who is involved including his attorney and stuff this is what some other people think so it may or may not have any real basis but from what i can tell it's just a theory that some people have he died in his prison cell from a heart attack and the reason why people suspected maybe foul play at least people in his life was because all of the blood vessels in his throat and the muscles they were all burst so some people felt like that was odd that, that that wasn't really consistent with a heart attack it seemed more consistent with strangulation but the official autopsy reads heart attack so i don't know why the salt lake city morticians would overlook some sort of foul play if if the physical evidence pointed to such there was also some rumors of a potential overdose after this and this is what I meant when I talked about in the intro that quote from JFK that a man may die, but his ideas continue to live on. Erville's writings that were left over in his cell, the ones he hadn't been able to sneak out through his followers or his wives, were actually preserved and then compiled into a book. So a lot of this scripture from his revelations that had been unseen up until this point was suddenly able to be read and also taught. And this new book was titled The Book of the New Covenant. And you might be thinking that now that Erville's dead, that's where this story ends, but it's actually just where another story begins because within the Book of the New Covenant, he includes a hit list. Like I said, all of these revelations are way more extreme, way more violent, way more just unhinged in general. So the hit list includes people who are former members of the cult, people who are current members of the cult, people who he feels like didn't do enough for him, former wives, former friends, children. And on top of that, he also creates a hierarchy within the book of people who are to take over for him in the event that he dies, naming one of his sons first. If one of his sons were to die, who's supposed to take over from that son and so on and so forth for several people. So he creates within the book of the new covenant, an entire chain of command. And in part two, because there is going to be a part two, we're going to go over the events that happen as a result of the book of the new covenant, because if you think the things that happened in this story were violent and crazy, it's it quite literally pales in comparison to what would happen as a result of this new scripture. Because I didn't post Spooky Saturdays for the last two weeks because I was in New York interviewing Neil, I will be posting this part two so that I can make it up to you guys a little bit. And my podcast comes out in two weeks and I have already recorded a bunch of podcast episodes in advance with various guests. So that will be super consistent. It'll be on here for the visual component. If you just want the audio, it's gonna be on Spotify and Apple Music. And if you made it this far, please like and subscribe. It really does help me. I would really appreciate it. Obviously don't like if you didn't actually like it, but if you find that you're unsubscribed, maybe consider it. And I'll see you guys tomorrow for part two. Thanks. Bye.